I'm going to share with you a part two of identity theft. We're talking about our identity. It's extremely important. It's rooted in the teachings of the New Testament as well as the Old Testament. And I think it's extremely important that we understand what God has to say about our identity that is found in him. Now, this is not a journey of being becoming prideful, egotistical, or self-centered. This is not uh, an avenue by which we become narcissistic, where we just fall in love with ourselves. No, it's to catapult us to properly love ourselves so that we can love others. And most of all, love God. We know there's going to be an assault, if there hasn't already in your life, against your own identity, who you are, why you're here. A question that may surface in your heart if you're young or if you're old. Sometimes your identity can be fragmented by a set of circumstances that you collide with or maybe something that you were anticipating God to do and he didn't quite do it in the timing or the way that you anticipated or expected. Well, that can fragment your identity or maybe individuals have given their opinion and it has been a crushing force in your life. It's been from your parents, maybe your spouse, children, Maybe a friend, work companion, colleague, I don't know, but the source might have been a cesspool of opinions that has had a crushing and polluting effect on your identity. How do we gain and form and fashion and cause the advance maturation, the development of your identity to be strong and healthy and stable and steady? We find that in Christ and in Christ alone. I don't say that in a general or generic sense. I don't say that superficially or artificially. I say that with absolute sincerity. Something as simple as that, when you apply it, it becomes profound. Jesus made a statement in Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, found in the New Testament, chapter 11, and verse 28, 29, and 30. We visited this in the part one of this teaching on our identity, being rooted in Christ. Jesus stated this, come to me. I know there's a myriad of different voices that extend an invitation to each one of us to come. It might be your circumstances, it might be your job, your calendar, your bank account, your boss, your spouse or children, or a variety of different individuals that will say, come, maybe it's your computer, your iPhone, I don't know. But we always get that invitation, come to me, come to me. I'm not saying it's intrinsically or innately evil. I'm just saying we have to step back and consider what's the highest priority. Whose voice are we going to listen to first? Whose voice will be preeminent? Whose voice will we respect the most and honor the most to descend over our ears and over our heart to shape and fashion us? I would invite you, as I know you do, to say I want it to be the Lord. So I'm going to come to him first and foremost. Jesus said, come to me, all you who labor or weary or heavy laden. There might be things you're carrying you ought not to be carrying. Maybe there's certain responsibilities on your to-do list that you're really not supposed to carry out. They have to be uh, delegated to someone else or possibly dismissed. Or maybe there's something far more intense, your emotional state. Maybe you're carrying guilt, shame, condemnation. It just weighs you down. It has such a crushing impact on your identity, your personhood, your personality, and your future destiny. You have to say, oh God, my heart is heavy laden. I need to have this rest that you provide. Jesus said, I will give you rest. Now we know rest is not the cessation of activity. It's not an invitation to be passive or apathetic. It's something far more, but what is it? What is this biblical rest that's spoken of by Jesus? It's presented in the Old Testament. It's accentuated in the book of Hebrews by the author of the book Hebrews in Hebrews 4 when he says that there's this Sabbath rest. What does that have to do with your identity? Everything. Because a rest is a a peace and a stability that comes over you that you know who you are without the comments or the opinions of others. And I don't negate the importance of that. I've had mentors in my life and I still do. I've told you before, in habit, since I was 16, I've always searched out Pauls in my life. I mean that in a broad sense. A Paul means someone who's older, stronger, more advanced, and wiser than I am in the Lord. It could be a male or female, but it's someone in my life. And so there have been men and women that have been Pauls in my life that have spoken into me. And then I also search out a Barnabas. That's a friendship, a colleague, an individual who's at the same pace that I am spiritually. 
I feel they're, they're basically in that same level spiritually where I'm at. And then I look for a Timothy or several Timothys. I've tried to have many in my life that maybe are younger in the Lord, not as advanced. They don't have a, a full understanding of Holy Scripture and walk in wisdom and spiritual maturity. And I don't say that in a condescending way. This is not an issue of pride. But I recognize that I'm older than them in the Lord and I want to speak into their life. So you form that cross. Have that in your life. It allows you to be healthy and also to advance a healthy spiritual state in others. If you don't, pursue it. Ask God, God, provide for me Paul's to speak into me, Barnabas's to run with me, and then Timothy's. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not, this is not gender sensitive. I know I'm using uh, all male names there, but look for that. Look for the Martha and the Mary in your life that can speak into you and those that you can run with and speak into. So we need input, yes. It helps shape and form our identity, yes. But you don't wanna just listen to others because then you will be man-made. If you listen only to your own voice, you'll be self-made. But if you listen to God's voice, you'll be God-made. You want his voice to be extended over your life like big hands, shaping you, fashioning you, and making you. Jesus said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle. Now, he gives us a window into his heart here, revealing his inner condition, state of being. He says, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you'll find rest for your soul. When you live with me, this is what is going to dominate you on the inside. And take note of what he says. He says he's gentle. That is not a lack of strength. That means it's an individual who's under control. It invites us to consider surrender to someone bigger and stronger and greater, namely God. Now, Jesus will say this here. At first you think, oh, wow, is he uh, negating or diminishing his deity? Not for one moment. He's accentuating his humanity. Theologians will call this basically an economic distinction. In other words, it's a statement that says Jesus is positionally the same as his father, However, functionally on earth in his humanity, he chose to surrender to his father. That's why he makes the statement in John 14, the father is greater than I. He doesn't mean greater in the sense positionally. He's God, the father is God, God the father, God the son, God the Holy Spirit. So it just doesn't dismantle the Trinity and it doesn't diminish his deity. It causes us to focus on the fact that Jesus on earth as a man was in surrender. To God. So that's why he says he's gentle. So it gives us an insight to a path we're to take to find peace, rest, a steadiness and a stability and a strength on the inside, an identity that's rooted and solid and strong. It's by an attitude, a disposition, an action, a conduct, a choice that says, I'm going to surrender to God. I surrender to you, Lord full and complete. I'm going to have a gentle heart. And then he goes on to say, I am lowly in spirit. Another way, another way of saying that is he's humble. And humility is basically the action of humility is obedience. That's submission. You see, the, the surrender is saying, I come under your control, God. You're in charge. I'm not. You're in control. The world kind of coils back at that. They feel, come on, be independent initiate, engage your will. You've got gifts, talents, and abilities. Don't in any way dismiss those from yourself. No, listen, surrender is not a loss of identity or a loss of will. Surrender is yielding and aligning your will with his, your identity with his. So you're in a position of surrender. That's actually a place of strength, of victory. I know in a military campaign, surrender means you've lost, but not so in the kingdom. Surrender means you've won. It's a paradox, but you've become an overcomer because you've surrendered your life to God and have come under his control. That is gentleness. That is surrender. And then there's the humility. I humble myself before you, God. That's submission, distinct from surrender. Submission says, I am ready to obey you. Whatever you say to me, I'll receive as a mandate, a dictate, a command, not to ensnare me, but to release me into the freedom that obedience, obedience brings into my life. I'll be fruitful and I'll be productive in you. So Jesus gives us a path to follow in order to achieve an identity that is solid, strong, 
and stable. For he says then, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You'll find rest for your soul. Boy, I wanna find that rest that's in God. And when we talk about identity, remember we're talking about how you understand yourself as well as how you understand your worth. Remember last week I said it's biblical to say that we are unworthy, but it's not biblical to say that we're worthless. God has defined our value. He's underscored that by sending his son to die for you and for me. How valuable you are to almighty God. If it was just one of us on the earth, he would have done it. That's not speculation or conjecture. That's solid in the truth of God. He loves you intensely. Sent his son just for you. That's a stamp of how valuable you are to God. So, who you are, where you're at, where you're going, it's important. We don't want to gain that again from others. I think it was Billy Graham who said, at the age of 20, we have an inordinate preoccupation with how others think about us. At the age of 40, we don't care what others think about us. And at the age of 60, we realize nobody's been thinking about us anyway. <laughs> There's probably a truth to that maxim. Seeing yourself through your eyes, that can be good or a bit dangerous. Seeing yourself through the eyes of others, again, that can be good or dangerous. Seeing yourself through circumstances that have unfolded in your life, positive and negative. That can be, you can be encircled with your education, your experience, your rearing, all of that. Is that going to define you? Or social norms in the context of our culture, how they uh, define who you are. Others can form a conclusion about you rapidly. A lot of our information is not based on fact, but inferences and value judgments. An inference is a statement basically about the uh, unknown based on the known. So you have limited information and you form a quick conclusion. Let me give you an example. It was probably several months ago, if not a year ago, that Pastor Derek and I had to meet with a particular woman. And in that meeting, we, there, were, there was levels of confrontation, but not too intense. And we did it. I never will meet with a woman alone. So I had Pastor Derek with me, and we just kind of challenged her in that situation. She was extremely receptive. Right on the heels of that, it was just a beautiful expression of God's love for her because the Lord gave me a word of knowledge. That means a piece of information that I didn't know about her that God just gave to me about her, her relationship with her daughter. And then he just put it on my heart, and I'm not trying to toot my horn here, but I'm just trying to give you the context of it, to give her $100. So I gave the $100 to her, and I said, I believe God wants you to do this with your daughter. She just started to weep uncontrollably, uncontrollably. Well, she collected herself, we prayed with her, and then she exited. And as she exited from the door, she was still crying. That's the picture, that's the end. Fast forward now, Pastor Derek and I also had to meet with another person, and that person refused to come. We inquired as to why. They said, well, we heard when a woman left your office, she was so, I guess, verbally abused by you, Pastor Z and Pastor Derek, that she was crying as she left. I, I, I said, what are you talking about? I, I'm not that mean-spirited. Ask Diane. I'm a pretty nice guy. Ladies, you don't have to be afraid of me. What went on? I don't get... And then I had... Oh my goodness, you're kidding. You see how misinformation can travel so rapidly? Did a woman leave my office crying? Yes. Was it because I verbally abused her? No, I gave her $100. Think of what she would have done if I gave her $1,000. So you, you gotta be so careful on the opinions of others, even about you, because it can be based a lot on inferences, value judgments, speculation, conjecture, what they may think or not think. So please, say the ultimate source is going to be you, God. And again, I'm not minimizing the value of meaningful friendships and relationships. You know I've emphasized the importance of being discipled and being mentored by others. But I really want to elevate my eyes are on you, Lord. I want to hear your voice. I want your voice, Psalm 29, which is strong and majestic, to shape me and make me and refine me and correct me and affirm me and do everything you need to do in my life.
Someone asked me at the door last Sunday, Pastor, how do you make that concept, which can seem a little mystical, an absolute reality? In other words, you say you want to hear the voice of God. Here's my conviction. I believe if you spend time in the written voice of God, right here, the Bible, it's a CD of him. When you listen to it, you take note of his intonations and his inflections and the momentum of his beautiful voice. You know his voice because you've spent time listening to a CD of his written voice. So when you close the Bible, you walk away, all of a sudden when you're talking and just pouring your heart out, you hear something, you'll say, that's him. Now it's not mystical, now it's not sure. You say, that's him, how do you know? I know, I know that's his intonations, it's his inflections, just like I know my own wife's voice. If she called, some of you would know, I would know it immediately. And you wouldn't think that that is phenomenal. You just say, yeah, because he lives with her. You live with the Lord and you read his word, his written voice. You get accustomed to what he sounds like. So when he speaks his spoken voice to you, you can say with confidence, I know that's him. I know that's him. No longer is it a mystery. Now it's a practical reality for you. Listen to his voice. Let him shape you, create you, and make you. If you simply listen to the, so, the, the, the society around us, there's what is called a, like a heroic narrative. In other words, what is celebrated? What is applauded? Where do they create a party around an individual? A culture will do that. They'll do it through the media. They'll do it through Hollywood. They'll do it through movies. They'll do it through conversations. They'll do it through political leadership, comedians. It just forms a momentum within the culture. And it's shifting within every culture. This heroic narrative. And again, the heroic narrative is, this is the person we should celebrate. This is the person we should applaud. In a traditional society, many times it has to do with community, how the person's reaching out to others. Sometimes in our Western society, that's more contemporary than traditional, it's individualism. We don't package it in a way that sounds selfish. We just say, hey, stand up. You know who you are. Come on. You have an identity, you have a sense of, of purpose, so come on, stand up. You have aspirations and dreams and goals and objectives and talents and gifts and abilities. They applaud that. Well, what's wrong with that? Well, just follow me. That's a, a norm within our culture, individualism. Is that really that good? Was that kind of the genesis of creating the Humanist Manifesto? of being self-centered, self-reliant, self-sufficient, self-independent. And there's also the sac self-sacrifice. And in some cultures, especially traditional ones, self-sacrifice, a willingness to give up your own for the cause or purpose of another. But self-assertion, think of that. It's packaged in a variety of different ways. You tell me in our society, self-assertion. Come on, go get it. Move forward. Don't be apathetic or passive or insipid. Be aggressive. Get what you need to get and achieve it. If it's with your education, if it's with your wealth, if it's your net worth, net worth, finances define who you are, the amount of things that you envelop yourself with, the car you drive, the coat you wear, the purse you carry, the shoes you wear, the house you live in. That defines who you are. Be self-assertive. And then you have honor, honor that is bestowed on certain individuals and in other cultures, and you tell me if it isn't present in our culture today, success. We applaud achievement and success. You don't know, I don't know, I think we all know. We suppress it at times. But you tell me what's coming down the pike. You tell me what's pushed upon us in our culture. To be individualistic, self-assertive, to pursue nothing but success. Oh, you do that. This society, this culture, especially here in America, you'll be applauded. They'll put a party in. There'll be cake and balloons and cards. Is that your standard? You've got to step back. It's a rhetorical question, but reflect on it. Is that your standard? And how can that corrode or pollute or corrupt your identity? Now, I told you in my own personal journey, it can be dangerous. 
You can take a path of self-rejection. That was the path I took for many, many years. I was basically intoxicated with self-rejection, fear of failure. I was just ensnared by that. Living my life as a performance, trying to please everybody. On the other side, the self-assertion can be just as dangerous because it evolves into independence and pride and arrogance and being egotistical, self-centered. But you know what? Both of those paths, though they might be different, self-rejection, self-hatred, self-assertion, pride, two different paths can lead to the same cliff, the abyss of being non-productive. In other words, you won't be fruitful. So this might be commended as heroic, but it's a false humility. And this might, well, you're independent, you're finally moving forward and engaging your will, but it can be pride. So we have to say, Lord, I want you to help me to discover my identity. And, but the worst thing to do is to just simply look within. Again, here, our society advises us to look on the inside. Look on the inside of you and find your dreams and your desires, your aspirations, your hopes, your expectations. Kind of look a little deeper and find your gifts, your talents, and your abilities. Again, is that innately wrong? No. But if that's all you do, that's really dangerous because you're the source. And if you are the source, you are, you are flooded with inconsistencies and contradictions. So it's not a good thing to be advised to simply look within. If you simply look within, look within yourself right now. There's times when you say, I desire this, but I also desire that. I want this, but I also want that. I'm thinking about that, but I'm also thinking about this. You spin and you spiral into so many different ways, so many different contradictions. Yes? Think of what you were like when you were 10 years old, 15 years old. When you peer back, you're like, whoa, wow. And you thought you had it all together. At 20, you thought you had it all together. You're going to look back 15 years from now and look back and say, whoa, there were some real inconsistencies and contradictions on the inside of me there. So should we look to ourselves as the source? No, this is not a, I'm not belittling you or mocking you. I'm identifying with you. I know the contradictions on the inside of me. So I'm not going to look in me to find out who I am. I'm going to look to the creator. I'm going to say, who did you make me to be? The potential that you deposited into my life. If you want a durable core, now a durable core of yourself that is consistent and stable and strong, and can weather through storms and circumstances that's unwavering and unshifting, you will only find that in Christ. Yes, that is the clear distinction between the humanist manifesto and the Christian manifesto. We exalt this reality, Philippians chapter 4 and verse 13, I can do all things through Christ. That's not a cute little phrase that's inserted. That substantiates everything we believe as, as Christians. I can do all things through Christ. I can only find my true identity in him. And it will be durable, long-lasting, strong, stable, consistent, and steady when it's in him. So here's the scripture I would give to you. It's one that I has, have made as my life verse, Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. This has everything to do with biblical identity. And it translates into your intrapersonal communication, communication within yourself, and interpersonal with others. I have been crucified with Christ. That doesn't mean you lose your identity. It's talking about where you're putting your roots. I'm rooted in the cross. And what Jesus did at Calvary, that's what's being said there. This is not personality suicide. It's no longer I live. It, it, that's not what's being said there, because right after that it says, in the night, life I now live. I have been crucified with Christ. That means I'm rooted in the cross, I'm rooted in Christ. It's no longer I who live. In other words, I'm not the dominant force in me. God is controlling me. I have surrendered my identity, my will, my personality to him. Christ lives in me. He is on the inside of me, so he's gonna impact my mindset, my disposition, my emotions, think of it. Remember I mentioned to you last week, your initial opinion-forming part of you are your emotions. 
I don't care if you're cerebral, academic, analytical, and logical. I don't, think, I don't care if you're even stoic. It is an absolute fact. Your initial conclusion or opinion on a matter as you form the conclusion are your emotions. So you've got to make sure your emotions don't master you. They serve you. You don't suppress them. You allow them to be awakened but serve you because they are very influential in the formation of your decisions and your choices, your emotions. So Lord, I want all of them to be influenced by you living on the inside of me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. And listen to this, talk about it affirming who you are, your identity, who love me, that's relational, and gave yourself up for me, that's sacrificial. Relational, sacrificial love enveloping you, encircling you, surrounding you, covering you, undergirding you. Talk about a tremendous place of stability. When you are in Christ, you're putting your roots in him. Just consider this hypothetical for a moment. I know it's absurd, but let's just personify a plant, and the plant is me, and I decide to disconnect from the soil. I'm out. And now I start to dance around on my roots and I start singing, I'm free, I'm free. I can do anything I want. You know what's been initiated. The disconnect means you've cut off the life source. I hope that is shown properly in the video. If we lose audio, all people are gonna see is, and they're gonna think, wow, your pastor kind of spazzed out there for a moment. We want to keep our roots in the Lord. Don't get disconnected. Seeing yourself through his eyes. And when you do, you'll have a healthy relationship with yourself. And that's a good thing. When you have a healthy relationship with yourself, you're able to love others properly and biblically and soundly. When you have a proper relationship with yourself, you're able to embrace a peace that can come over you because you're joined with God. You know, when the Bible speaks about peace, it's not tranquility, it's stability. It's a stability that comes over you because you're connected to God. In the Old Testament, it's called shalom, a wholeness. In the New Testament, the Greek word is irene. It means to join together. Now think again of Galatians 2.20. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and delivered himself up for me. Christ I'm joined with you, I'm rooted in you. This has a direct impact on my identity. It creates a place of peace because I'm joined to you. Isaiah 26 and verse three, it says, the mind stayed on you is kept in perfect peace. A peace that comes over your soul, your intellect, your emotions, your will, your whole attitude and actions and conduct of your life, your behavior, it's a peace that comes over you because you're connected to him. Jesus said in John 14, I'm gonna give you a peace that the world cannot give to you. And in Philippians four and verse seven, it says, I'm gonna give you a peace that goes beyond understanding that will envelop your mind and your heart. It's like a military term that's used there. It's to guard your mind and to guard your heart. You can walk in peace, put together, joined together correctly because you're with him. When the scripture says, love your neighbor as you love yourself, again, as I've reiterated through this entire uh, sermon and last Sunday as well in this message, it's properly loving yourself. It's not falling in love with yourself. It's not becoming narcissistic and self-centered. That's a perversion. To properly love yourself is extremely important. Here's why. The way you love yourself is the way you're gonna love others. That's how it's going to translate into your behavior. You'll, if you see yourself through God's eyes, you'll see others through God's eyes. Yesterday in the men's meeting, Pastor Ted gave an excellent message from Acts chapter nine, dealing with Paul when he was converted. Remember Paul on the way to Damascus, he, he, he falls to the ground, he hears the voice, he's blinded. And then Pastor Ted focused in on Ananias. And as he did that, all of a sudden, something popped into my head as I was listening to him. And I thought Paul was blind, but so was Ananias. Why do I say that? Because Ananias was looking through the lens of his own eye at Paul. 
Because when God says to Ananias, hey, I want you to go to Paul and Saul and I want you to uh, pray over him and that his blindness would be released from him. His immediate response is, through my lens, that's the guy who's persecuting the church. He can do me harm as he's done others. And the Lord says, oh, no, no, no. Ananias, look through my lens. He doesn't actually say that, but he's inviting him to look at Paul in a different way. He says, he's gonna be my apostle to the Gentiles. I have found when I look through the lens that God provides me with, a microscope and like a telescope, I can see the intimate things in me as well as the broad call on my life. When I look through the lens that God gives to me to see myself, I also then use that very same lens, God's eye, to look at others. It helps me, especially those that I might have a propensity to reject just because maybe their personality rubs me wrong or their intellect, or their demeanor, or something that they're wearing, or how they talk or don't talk, their education. We can be so prejudiced and biased from ourselves, can't we? But when we step back and say, Lord, I wanna see her, I wanna see him through the right lens. But you have to start by doing it first with yourself. Say, Lord, thank you for the lens of seeing myself through your eyes, because I know that's gonna impact how I treat others. You know, Diane knows immediately if I'm kind of cantankerous in my behavior with her, sometimes she'll look at me and say, do you not like Gary today? And sometimes she hits it right on. Have you ever awoken and not liked yourself? Come on, be honest with me in church. Not too many shook their head yes in the first service. I felt intimidated I was gonna go sit down and stop preaching. There's mornings and I don't like Gary, and I've got to immediately get before the Lord. I told you, I can have a propensity towards self-rejection. So I've got to disengage. I'm not going to go down the path of pride, but I definitely need help. So I look up and say, Lord, please help me. Because the way I'm going to love myself right now is going to translate in how I love others. And Diane can pick that up immediately as my spouse, my children can, others can, and in the workplace. They know. You want to go there and say, I properly love you myself so I can properly love you. Hebrews 4, 9 through 11 speaks to us about this incredible rest that comes over us. We started there. We're going to end here where Jesus spoke about a rest that we can enter into. Here's a rest that God's provided. It says it this way. There remains a Sabbath rest. Now, the writer of the book of Hebrews, we don't know exactly who it is. You can conjecture. It could be Paul. It could be Apollos. All we do know is he was under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It's part of the canon of the New Testament. It's inspired. It's the word of God. But he coins a term here. He actually invents a word that no one ever used. You'll not find it anywhere else in the entire New Testament. You won't find it in the vernacular of the Greek-speaking uh, uh, nation in the first century. It's just a unique word because he's kind of marrying the Old Testament and the New Testament together of the Sabbath and the rest and marrying them. Well, how does that impact our identity? Well, it tells us of the completeness and the wholeness that God wants to bring upon us. There remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God, for anyone who enters God's rest, also rest from their works, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter in that rest. Obviously, this is not the cessation of activity because this is a paradox. He says, enter into your rest, really strongly, diligently enter into that rest. So there's something you and I have to do. We have to activate our will, engage our will in the direction of saying, Lord, I come to you. I'm rooted in you. May you just speak this Sabbath rest over my life. And what is that Sabbath rest? That sense of being absolute, complete, and whole in him. Not the absence of activity. It's the active participation in what God is doing in you and through you. That's why you have this passage in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 and 13. This is what it says. Work out your salvation. What? I got to work? Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Knowing God, not you, is at work in you, both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. It's a paradox. Yeah, but you got to marry the two. When you come to the same thing with the Sabbath rest, wow, I've got to do this. I've got to engage in this. I've got to work out my salvation with fear and trembling, but it's with the keen awareness that it really is a partnership and a cooperation with the living God who's at work on the inside of me. God is at work on my identity and my personality. 
my personhood so that I can properly love myself and love others. God, you are at work in me and I'm gonna cooperate with you. I can't do this in my own power or strength. Listen, Christianity is not self-will. Christianity is an empowered will. It's a big difference. How you answer this question, do you think you could pull off the Christian walk? How you answer that question is gonna set you down a path for the rest of your life. You've gotta respond the way the Bible teaches us to respond. You can't. He can. You gotta let him flow through you. God, I can't do this. Oh, there may be certain battles that you can gain victory in your own will and strength. Yeah, boom, boom, I, bam, I can win that one. I guarantee there's other battles you've never won and you will never win with your own willpower. You need an empowered will. Then you will always be victorious because your reliance is not on self, but on God. Lord, grant me that Sabbath rest that descends over my life where you say it's finished. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended the work and he had done and he rested on the seventh day. That's not inactivity again, it's completion. That's why it says in Philippians 1 and verse 6, being confident in this very thing that he who begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. He'll make you good, he'll make you complete, and he will make you whole. And the Bible says that's holiness. God, I don't have to live my life trying to please others or perform. I'm rooted in you. Talk about a peace and a rest that can come over your soul all the days of your life. Amen. Let's stand together. We're going to close with this song. And I'm going to just ask you, if, if you'd like special prayer, the altars, that means the front of the church right here is always available with leaders to pray for you. If you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, can I invite you to consider today saying, I want to give my life over to him. I want to be rooted in the cross, rooted in a relationship with him and receive him to be my savior the forgiver of my sins and the ultimate Lord of my life. But for all of us here as believers, just allow this be the moment. This is the moment. We're just gonna sing it through and then let God just deposit this deeply into your heart so you could say, God, the Holy Spirit, what are you specifically saying to me right now? What part of that message, all of a sudden he shot it into your soul like an arrow? Let this be that moment. Then we'll all head out We'll have a great afternoon, but don't miss this grace moment when the Holy Spirit just kind of drives it in as we sing this song. We can sing this. It is well with my soul when my life is rooted in Christ and I look to him to shape and form and fashion my identity. Father, we know the only way we could declare that is when our life is rooted in you, Jesus. And we thank you that at the cross we find our identity and you catapult us into a world that is desperate for love and we can love the world with your love and the way we properly love ourselves. And now may the blessing of Almighty God be on your life. On your life, I pray this blessing. That you would prosper and flourish and be productive and fruitful because you're rooted in Christ that you will have a durable self in Christ that will always be stable, at peace, and at rest. I pray this blessing on your life, no longer to live your life to impress others, to please others, or to perform for others, or even for God, but you'll be at peace and at rest in the wholeness that he does in you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Would you say, I receive this blessing? Amen. God bless you.